Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome back for the new week of studies. As we return to our studies in the book of Daniel, shall we give praise to our Heavenly Father for his guidance and the blessings that he is currently providing. For each day, his blessings are new. Shall we thank him in prayer for helping us in these studies so that we may more clearly understand that which we need to know at this time? Will you now join me in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we come before you in this new week. We thank you for your grace, for your blessings, for your watch care, and for your guidance. Direct us now. Help us as we open your word that we might more clearly understand that which is written. Be with us in this conversation, Father. Guide us in all that you would have done. Help us as we study as we discuss, as we deal with each other, so that we might more clearly be prepared to give a message that you would want given to this earth in its last moments. May your angels attend us. May your spirit guide us. We invite all to join with us for your glory so that your will is done. In this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, I believe we left off here with verse 28. Mm -hmm. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. So it's interesting, the first portion of this verse says that he will return to his land with great riches, and the last portion says, and return to his own land. Why? Why is this being doubled? Why is this being repeated? Well, I'm just looking at the Hebrew here. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I don't think of it as a doubling, personally, but um, so, I mean, I know his the land is doubled, but... Um, they're not like doubled where it's like, a, you know, the two words in the same sentence. But, uh, no, but you have return and land, return and land. Mm -hmm. Except like, that talking about different, different events. So that's all I'm saying. It's not like the one thought is doubled, like in the, in the same action. You know, like in grieving, he shall be grieved or something like that, you know, or, Anyway, I don't know whatever thoughts you have on that. Well, I'm just I'm I'm asking because <clears throat> I'm trying to understand exactly, you know, what they're driving at at this point. Well, I, I just don't think it's a doubling in the sense of like, you know, Babylon has fallen, has fallen or anything like that. Because they're talking about two different actions. It's not the same event. So why is his heart against the Holy Covenant? And what kind of exploits, which is an added word, is he going to do? Yeah, well. Now, the in the 1769 Bible, the reference that they use with this with great riches would be 1 Maccabees 1, 19. So we have the symbol here of both 191 and 911. <clears throat> Thus they got the strong cities in the land of Egypt, and he took the spoils thereof. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, and that's what we have is our understanding of it. Mm. Now, the, the other portion is that when it's speaking of his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, the reference there was given back partially to Daniel eleven twenty two. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. The translators also used a number of verses out of First Maccabees. So we're talking from First Maccabees 1, verse 20 to 24, and then Second Maccabees 5.11, 5.14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Okay, so this, so I'm just trying to read this here. 
in First Maccabees is dealing with uh, an earlier history. Right. <clears throat> it's not dealing with the history we're talking of, we're studying. What is this? It, so this is Antiochus in First Maccabees. Which Antiochus is this? Antiochus Epiphanes. Oh, so this is so they're relating this to Antiochus Epiphanes. I Correct. See. Yeah, which we're not. So. Correct. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. So his heart being against the holy covenant. So he he returned to his land with great substance. That is uh, the way that we would understand that. Um, this has to do with the wealth of Egypt, and 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 that was going to be. Um, that's Augustus who takes the wealth of Egypt, right? That's right after the. The Battle of Actium, he pagan Rome's pagan Rome's heart. So that's when he's going to be opposed to Christianity. So here we can't take this as Augustus. When it says his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, uh, that's not Augustus. Right. Right. That's the way that we looked at it. We just said that this is just pagan Rome in the general sense, not referring to Augustus. So it has to do with the fall of Egypt. And then it's going to reference us because this is all about what's going to happen with the destruction of Jerusalem and its connection to the battle of Actium. So then uh, Rome is going to be begin persecuting Christians and he shall do right. So that's going to be uh, and return to his own land. So it's just talking about about Rome uh, coming against uh, God's people. So it's not talking about Augustus here. So we just we just put this in the general sense of Rome. So then, with that being said, <clears throat> when we're looking at this <clears throat> that Smith had written, mm -hmm. his, his comment is: two returnings from foreign conquests are are here brought to view. The first after the events narrated in verses 26 and 27. So I'm going to stop there because 26, mm -hmm. 27. Yea, they that feed on the portion of his meat shall destroy him and his army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain. Mm -hmm. And both these kings heart shall do mischief and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper for Yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Here, Smith is making the application that this is Antony and Augustus Caesar. Yeah, which we have the same application. Okay. <clears throat> Yet we're saying here in verse 28 that it cannot involve Augustus Caesar. The first part of the verse does. Okay. Because Augustus Caesar's heart was not against the Holy Covenant. Right. Antony's was not against the Holy Covenant. Yeah. So Smith is stating two returnings from foreign conquests are here brought to view. The first after the events narrated in 26 and 27. And the second after this power had had indignation against the Holy Covenant and performed exploits. The first was fulfilled in the return of Caesar against his expedition against Egypt and Antony. <clears throat> he returned to Rome with abundant honor and riches, for says Prido, at, su at this time such vast riches were brought to Rome from Egypt on the reducing of that country and the return of Octavianus, seek Caesar and his army from thence that the value of money fell one half and the price of provisions and all vendable wares were doubled thereon. Augustus Caesar celebrated his victories in a three days triumph, a triumph which Cleopatra herself would have graced as one of the royal captives had she not artfully caused herself to be bitten by an asp. The next great enterprise of the Romans after the overflow of Egypt was the expedition against Judea and the capture and destruction of Jerusalem. 
The Holy Covenant is doubtless the covenant which God has maintained with his people, beginning it with Abraham and renewing it since Christ with all believers in him. The Jews rejected Christ, and according to the prophecy that all who would not hear that, that prophet should be cut off. They were destroyed out of their own land and scattered to every nation under heaven. Now, while Jews and Christians alike suffered under the oppressive hands of the Romans, we think that it was re the reduction of Judea especially that the exploits mentioned in this text were exhibited. Would we have agreement with Smith on this portion? Yeah, that's the position we took. Under Vespasian, the Romans invaded Judea and took the cities of Galilee, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, where Christ had been rejected. They destroyed the inhabitants and left nothing but ruin and desolation. Titus besieged Jerusalem. He drew a trench around it, according to the prediction of the Savior. A terrible famine ensued, the equal of which the world has perhaps at no other time witnessed. Moses had predicted in the time of the ter in the terrible calamities to come upon the Jews if they departed from God. Even the tender and delicate women should eat her own children in the straightness of the siege, wherewith their enemies should distress them. Under the siege of Jerusalem by Titus, a literal fulfillment of this prediction occurred. And he, hearing of the inhuman deed, but forgetting that he was the one who was driving them to such direful extremities, swore the eternal extirpation of the accursed city and people. Jerusalem fell in AD 70 as an honor to himself. The Roman commander had determined to save the temple, but the Lord had said there should not remain one stone upon another, which should not be thrown down. A Roman soldier seized a brand of fire and climbing upon the shoulders of his comrades, thrust it into one of the windows of the beautiful structure. It was soon in the arms of the devouring element. The frantic efforts of the Jews to extinguish the flames were seconded by Titus himself, but all in vain. Seeing that the temple must perish, Titus rushed in and bore away the golden candlestick, the table of showbread, and the volume of the law wrapped in golden tissue. The candlestick was afterwards deposited in Vespasian's temple to peace and copied on the triumphal Ark of Titus, where its mutilated image is yet to be seen. The siege of Jerusalem lasted five months. In that siege, 1,100,000 ,000 Jews perished and 97,000 were taken prisoner. The city was so amazingly strong that Titus exclaimed when viewing the ruins, we have fought with the assistance of God. The city was completely leveled, and the foundations of the temple were plowed by Terentius Rufus. The duration of the whole war was seven years, and 1,462,000 persons are said to have fallen victim to its, victims to its fatal horrors. Thus, this power performed great exploits and again returned to its own land. Again, are we in agreement with Smith on this? Mm -hmm. So this literal fulfillment has occurred in the past. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is the past. Okay. And at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. <clears throat> the time appointed is probably the prophetic time of verse 24, of which we have previously spoken. It closed, as already shown, in AD 330, at which time this power was to return and come again toward the south, but not as on the former occasion, when it went to Egypt, nor as the latter when it went to Judea. Those were expeditions which resulted in conquest and glory. This led to demoralization and ruin. This removal of the seat of the empire to Constantinople was the signal of the downfall of the empire. Rome then lost its prestige. 
the Western Division was exposed to the incursions of the foreign enemies. On the death of Constantine, the Roman Empire was divided into three parts between his three sons, Constantius, Constantine II, and Constans. Constantine II and Constans quarreled, and Constans, being victor, gained the supremacy of the whole West. He was soon slain by one of his commanders, who in turn was shortly after defeated by the, for a, the surviving emperor, and in despair ended his own days, A.D. 353. The barbarians of the north soon began their depredations and extended their conquests till the imperial power of the west expired in A.D. 476. This was indeed different from the two former movements brought to view in the prophecy and to this fatal step of removing the seat of empire from Rome to Constantinople directly led. So any comments on this part? Um, well, because we had taken a little bit different position regarding the time, because we have two different periods. Um, so there's some differences we have there with Smith. But also we looked at the time appointed quite a bit differently than Smith. So the time appointed, which is Moed, okay. we actually look at it as November 9th, 1989. So, well, we have different possibilities. So what, what we had was uh, different ways that we could read this entire text. So we, uh, this entire verse. So we had, you know, at the time appointed, that that refers to November 9th, 1989 that the papacy in the USA, the king of the north, uh, shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former, that is, uh, the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, in that it is the spiritual north and south and not literal, or as the latter, um, also western, that is, the fall of western Rome in 410 and 476, in that it is not pagan literal Rome, but papal spiritual Rome. So, so we're taking this time appointed. Um, we're, we're just putting it right into our history. So that, that's one option. And then when we look at what the former and the latter is, uh, we're going to differ with him on that. Now, another way that we look at it is uh, the former is again um, is is going to refer to 30 BC and the latter to 1798. So that's another option. Um, and looking at the, it's the spiritual north and south and not the literal. Or as in the latter, that is the north against the south and not the south against the north. So we, we had all these different ways in which we could look at it. Uh, but in each one of these, we have the time appointed being 1989, November 9th, 1989. And we looked at the time appointed being 1798. Uh, but we rejected that idea. Whether whether we're correct in how we looked at it, I know it's, it would take a while to go back into it uh, to get it all straightened in our minds again. But we're just saying that that the former and the latter uh, can't be what Smith say say it is, and that the time appointed he has the time appointed as um, basically three thirty. Right, 330 AD, uh, but that we rejected. Because what, what's being described here is that the king of the north is going to come against the king of the south. And that's why we have 1989. Right. Right. So, you know, in, in our way makes a lot of sense. It, it brings us to, you know, Daniel 11, verse 40b, and, and it explains basically uh, the context of, of how the destruction of Jerusalem and all these different things are connected with our present history. It tells us why we're looking at our, why we're looking at these things at all is so that we at the end of the world can understand our present history. And so when you have the King of the North coming against the King of the South, um, there's, you know, different ways in which we can say which is the latter and which is the former, right? 
Uh, so the former either is that, you know, the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, the latter, the fall of Western Rome, um, the, the fall of uh, Egypt in 30 BC uh, connected with 1798. So that is you're paralleling uh, those two events um, or uh, the latter being time appointed November 9th 2019 he the papacy the USA king of the north shall return and come toward the south which is being the USSR but the latter that is November 9th 2019 shall not be as the former that's a different reading in that the north and the south are reversed and then uh, the other one is again we have November 9th but then but the last shall not be as the first, that is the omega, shall not be as the alpha, in that the north and south are reversed, right? So in, in that case, uh, so the, the first then being 1798. I, I think that's the one I liked the most, was that one, that it's just saying at the time appointed, we're going to have, uh, that, that this is, 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 Basically, Daniel 11, verse 40b is, um, you know, there's this this inversion that happens. So uh, there's two that are kind of fairly good ways of looking at it. But the last shall not be as the first is kind of, or the latter shall not be as the former. Both of those uh, are, are better readings, right, than the idea that um, or as the latter or as the former. I, I don't really like those readings. I don't know if everybody followed that. Nope. Do we need to go over that again? Here, the, do, can I share my screen here? And, if so, you don't mind, can you go over it again? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So when we're looking at Daniel 11, verse 29, in, in the King James, the way that it reads is, is I, I don't think correct, but it, you know, it just basically says, uh, let me see here, just without all the other stuff. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So, so this, the he is now the king of the north, right? Okay. So the king of the north is Rome, right? Rome has become the king of the north and he's going to come towards the south. And it's already addressed the fall of of Egypt, right? We've, we've had that already occur. And so this time appointed, Uriah Smith is going to place as, you know, 30, 330 AD, right? So he's going to go at the end of even for a time. We're saying that this time appointed here is something that's future. And we looked at different possibilities. Um, since it's a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, we're going to connect this to Daniel 11, verse 40, right? So that that time appointed is that, that period of time that's connected to the time of the end. And the question is, which time of the end is this? We tried to look at it being 1798, but it didn't work. Because in 7, 1798, well... You have the king of the south come against the king of the north. But here the king of the north is coming against the king of the south. And that, of course, is Daniel 11, verse 40b. Okay. So so what we did is we, we looked at these different ways we could read this text. So at the time appointed, he shall return. So the he being the papacy. So ignore the present truth stuff there in red for now. The United States the USA, the king of the north, shall return and come toward the south, that being the Soviet Union. But it shall not be as the former. So that would be the fall of Egypt in 30 BC when the king of the north came against the king of the south, right? Okay. In that it is now the spiritual north and south and not literal, or as the latter. So that was when Western Rome fell from you know, 410 to 476, in that it is not pagan, literal Rome, but papal, spiritual Rome. So again, it's 
it's in this, and, and, and these are all okay, right? Each of these interpretations. If we're, if we're going to take how it's written in the King James, and we're going to say that, well, there was a former that's going to be the fall of the King of the South. It's not like that in that it's spiritual and not literal. Or as the latter, the fall of Western Rome, which is the other event, um, in that it's, again, it's not literal Rome, but spiritual, right? So the, the contrast here is that when we get to the end of the world, we're not dealing with literal, we're dealing with spiritual. So that's one possibility of reading the text. Uh, the next one is, 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 is similar. You know, we, again, we're going to have November 9th, 1989 as the time appointed. And the papacy in the USA, the king of the north, shall return and come towards the south again. It's the Soviet Union. But it shall not be as the former. So in this case, we would just say the fall of Egypt in that it is the spiritual north and south and not literal. Or as the latter, this in this sense being 1798, in that it is the north against the south and not the south against the north. So that's a possibility, too. So um, so there's a former and a latter. I'm, I'm not in favor of this one too much, but but it is a possible reading of it, that the latter refers to Daniel 11, verse 40a, right? Um, another way to read this is uh, um, that the latter shall not be as the former, right? So in this case, this is how I actually prefer the Hebrew. Where, where the King James says it shall not be as the latter, neither shall it be as the former. But this here says the latter shall not be as the former. And so we're still going to have the time of the end or the time appointed, November 9th, 1989, that the papacy of the United States, the King of the North, shall return and come toward the South, again, the Soviet Union. Uh, but the latter, that is, 1989 shall not be as the former 1798 in that the north and south are reversed so it's it's comparing daniel 11 40a and 40b as daniel 11 40a is the former daniel 11 40b is the latter and this this is pretty good right um and now the other one is, is very similar um so at the time appointed, uh, again, 1989, November 9th, papacy United States, being the king of the north, shall return and come toward the south, the Soviet Union. But the last, 1989, shall not be as the first, 1798, in that the north and south are reversed. So this is actually very similar, right? The, the difference sort of here has to do with the alpha and omega, so the battle, it's more when you look at the present truth application of this, that there's some differences, not not a lot. So these two, this way of reading the Hebrew makes more sense to me. OK, All right. So so that that's how we looked at this verse. And so so we have a difference with Uriah Smith, but it's not something that he would have been able to see because he's not going to know about November 9th, 1989. And then we looked at, you know, if the time appointed was 1798 and. It just didn't end up working. So we just got rid of that. Okay. Is that, that help? You can go back to sharing yours. So I, I think this was a pivotal verse, the understanding of this verse, especially I think just, but the latter shall not be as the former or the last shall not be as the first. Okay. So, so did that help William? So the former, the former is 1798. Yeah. And the latter is 1989. So it, it ties us directly to Daniel 11, verse 40. That makes sense? Okay. Yeah, I was just trying to mm -hmm. figure out if, if the, how would you apply this to, let's say, the Democrats and the Republicans as far as... Well, we're not applying it to the Democrats and Republicans. Well, we consider the Dem Democrats South and the uh, and the Republicans North, right? Well, in some applications, but we're not making that application here. Okay, all right. 
Right. So that's that's where we're looking. Uh, our present truth application has to do more with the internal within the movement, because this verse brings us to the time of the end in our history being fulfilled with what happens with the United States and the Soviet Union. Now, I'm not saying you can't make an application to the Democrats and Republicans. You probably could. But that's not the application we made. We looked at this more as internal within the movement. Okay. I got you. It is. So maybe there's an external application that we didn't look at to deal with the North and the South. But I don't know how you would do that with with what's happened in the United States. I mean, we, we've touched on it here and there. But we haven't had a really solid interpretation of how how to do that how we would look at this American Civil War. I think that's something that we need to to study in probably after we get through Daniel chapter 11, uh, finishing this, is actually take a better look at um, uh, the structure of these civil wars uh, within uh, Israel and the United States. So, you know, closer look at these things. Because, you know, we're heading towards a civil war in the U.S. And, you know, if it wasn't for just a couple of centimeters different, we could be in a full-blown civil war already uh, from yesterday. You know, so if that if Trump wasn't still alive, um, I think we'd have quite a different world than what we have right now. Doesn't mean it's not moving towards that world, but it would have happened much quicker. Much more quickly. Yes. Okay. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. If if something like this happens to either Trump or Biden, I think that a full blown conflagration will occur. But that's not something that is the subject of what we're studying right now. No, not not directly. The only thing I can say about it. I mean, because we'll probably talk about it more as time goes on. But, you know, you're going to have, of course, uh, you know, the Americans can pull together when things like this happen. Right. Correct. But there's always an element that wants to create more and more division. And, you know, uh, there, there there's something about America that's hard for other people of other countries to understand. But. When, when it comes to like American pride, this sort of this underlying type of nationalism, it is actually a uniting force within the United States. And in some ways, you know, when something like this happens, the United States do tend to pull together. But then there's always that element that that's going to try to use this to create more and more division. So it'd just be interesting to see how it works out. But I do think later on, you know, once once things sort of shake out a little bit um, in which direction people are going to go with this, uh, you know, those are things that we're going to have to discuss. But, I mean, prophetically, we know the United States is heading towards a civil war. So just how quickly that's going to happen, it's hard to say. I mean, right now they're in a cold civil war, but uh, it's a... It's, it's definitely not a hot civil war yet, but it will be. Okay. Okay. Now we proceed to the next article. Now it's interesting because the first verse for this article in the 1769 King James has a paragraph break. So this is a new thought. This is a, a new direction for the chips of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So here again, the Holy Covenant is mentioned twice. The ships of Chittim, which would be Kittim. Okay, Kittim. Yeah, because they don't have a, a, a ch sound in Hebrew. So chitim would be more literally. So when you right. see that, it's just uh, uh, 
a hard a hard H sound. Hard H or a hard K? Well, we call it a hard H, which is what we would call a H, like Bach. Okay. Yeah, not sh. <laughs> anyway, that's just me being technical about. That's mm-hmm. fine. <laughs> so, the ships of Kittim shall come against him. In the past, we've always applied this as being a symbol of economic strength, right? Ships, yeah, the ships of Kittim. And now we we connect this, of course, with uh, Revelation to the Vandals. Okay. So historically, the ships of Kittim is going to be dealing with the fall of Western Rome. Would this have anything to do with the tar- ships of Tars as well? Well, no. Okay. No, it does, doesn't have to do with the ships of Tar Tarshish. So the ships of Kittim is is a direct re- re- reference to uh, the trumpets, right? So the fall of Western Rome, and and you can see here in in the context that we have in in how we looked at these these verses that there is in a sense the the latter and the former, so that first interpretation we had of Daniel 11.29, where it was talking about the fall of Egypt and then the fall of Western Rome, um, there was a logic there in looking at this as the fall of Western Rome here. But but still, it's the fall of Western Rome. It's just that we don't connect verse 29 to that as far as being uh, the former. Right, because originally we had the former as being the fall of Western Rome. So this is just moving on historically into this period uh, dealing with the fall of Western Rome and the rise of the papacy. So the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate. So that's what verse 30 is preparing us for, because that's going to be verse 31. Okay, so Smith's comment here. The prophetic narrative still has reference to the power which has been the subject of the prophecy from the 16th verse, namely Rome. What were the ships of Kittim that came against this power? And when was this movement made? What country or power is meant by Kittim? Dr. A. Clark on Isaiah 23 verse 1 has this note. From the land of Kittim, it is revealed to them. The news of the destruction of Tyre by Nebuchadnezzar is said to be brought to them from Kittim, the islands and coasts of the Mediterranean. For the Tyrians, says Jerome on verse 6, when they saw that they had no other means of escape, fled in their ships and took refuge in Carthage, and in the islands of the Ionian and Aegean Sea. So also Jokri on the same place. Kitto gave the same locality to Kittim, namely the coast and islands of the Mediterranean. And the mind is carried by the testimony of Jerome to a definite and celebrated city as situated in that land, namely Carthage. So it's interesting here that in the use of a couple of different commentaries, Smith is now making the application that Kittim must be Carthage. Yeah, which is the position we take because that has to do with the Vandals. All right. Right. So, do do y'all know what verse um, 23, verse 1 says? Isaiah. Isaiah. Yeah, Isaiah. Can I read it? Please. The burden of Tyre, how ye ships of Tarshish, for in this land, land, this, for it, for it is laid waste, so that the, that there is no house, no entering in, for the land of Kittim is, I think it is revealed to them. Mm-hmm. That's first one. Yep. And I just, I just thought it was, I just thought it would, I could, if it would be all right, I could read it. Yeah, but what? So, what do you see from that? What is it? 
what I'm looking at is the United States going into the land of Kittim, which is we we were saying that that Kittim is where well, Kittim is the is what brought down Rome, right? But we're connecting the ships of Kittim to the Vandals coming against the Roman Empire. That's right. That's That's the, the, from from Carthage. Right. Okay. So, so that's I'm just trying to work it out in my head, Theodore. Now you see here the ships of Tarshish, right? Yeah. This this is saying that Tarshish is going to be laid waste, um, and this is going to come from the land of Kitten. Okay. Right? Tarshish right. here is this is going to symbolize Rome being attacked by uh, the Vandals. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And that's why you had asked the question about are the ships of Tarshish the same as the ships of Kittim? And of course they're not because they're in opposition to each other. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank so you. So Tarshish is going to end up uh, symbolizing Rome in its dis- it being destroyed. It's going to be laid waste. So Kittim, the land of Kittim does that historically to Tarshish, right? And, right. and so that's going to happen with the fall of Rome. So we're making a parallel between what happens to Tarshish from the ships of Kittim, from the land of Kittim, to what happens with the Roman Empire, with the Vandals. All right. Okay. That makes All sense? Right. You, you make, please make sense. Okay. Good. Okay, comment from the chat. Duration between 3.30 of 81 when Reagan was shot to 713 of 2024 when Trump was shot, 15,811 days or 43 years, three months, 13 days. Wonder whether these numbers have any significance. Well, okay. Reagan was shot in 81. And this is coming not very long after his inauguration. It was also, I believe, in 1981 when John Paul II was shot. Now, is there any parallel with that? Well, the only thing about, uh, we know that May 13th, 1981, so that's going to be when Reagan was attempted assassination. Reagan's was March 30th, according to the, sh- to the chat. Okay, March, and so it's going to be the Pope that's May 13th? 1981. I'm just trying to read this. Yeah. So it's going to be, so you got March 30th and May 13th, 1981. Right. So yeah, I'm just checking on, on when they, now the May 13th, 1981 for the Pope, that has to do with Fatima, the first, the anniversary of the first apparition from 1917 to 1981, 64th anniversary of, but yeah, so you got March 30th, um, and May 13th. And then you have this. I don't know. I don't know if there's any connection. But, uh... As you just noted, May 13th of 81 to July 13th of 2024. So in other words, you would have had about 45 days between the two assassination attempts of Reagan and the Pope. And I think 45 is something that we've noted multiple times as being a number that that we've placed some kind of significance. What day was the Pope shot? Um, May 13th, 1981. That would be 44 days after, but 45th day, if you count inclusive. Right. So, so yeah, I agree, 45 inclusive days. Anyway. Okay. Was ever a naval warfare with Carthage as a base of operation waged against the Roman Empire? Those who have read of the terrible onslaught of the Vandals upon Rome under the fierce Jim Serek can easily answer in the affirmative. Sallying every spring from the port of Carthage at the head of his numerous and well-disciplined naval force, he spread consternation through all the maritime provinces of the empire. That this is the work brought to view is further evident when we consider that we are brought down in prophecy to this very time. In verse 29, the transfer of empire to Constantinople we understand to be mentioned. 
following in due course of time as the next remarkable revolution came the eruptions of the barbarians of the north prominent amongst those was the vandal war already mentioned the years ad 428 to 468 mark the career of genseric he shall be grieved in return this may have reference to the desperate efforts which were made to dispossess Genseric of the sovereignty of the seas, the first by Majorian, the second by Leo, both of which proved to be utter failures. And Rome was obliged to submit to the humiliation of seeing its provinces ravaged and its eternal city pillaged by the enemy. Indignation against the covenant, that is, the Holy Scriptures, the Book of the Covenant. A revolution of this nature was accomplished in Rome. The Goths, the Huns, the Vandals who conquered Rome embraced the Arian faith and became enemies of the Catholic Church. It was especially for the purpose of exterminating this heresy that Justinian decreed the Pope to be the head of the Church and the corrector of heretics. Then it was decreed that the Bible was a dangerous book and should not be read by the common people, but all questions in dispute should be submitted to the Pope. Thus was indignity heaped upon God's word. And the emperors of Rome, the eastern division of which still continued, had intelligence or connived with the Church of Rome, which had forsaken the covenant, and constituted the great apostasy for the purpose of putting down heresy. The man of sin was established by the defeat of the Arian Goths, who then held possession of Rome in A.D. 538. Any comment about this passage from Smith? Well, he's basically correct. Um, kind of uh, long-winded on it. but uh, Quite verbose, yes. Yeah. Um, now, so one of the things we had regarding uh, verse 30 um, where it says, you know, for which, uh, for the ships of Kitten, we we had it put there that uh, the Hebrew um, has a word that's not numbered or translated in the Strongs and is best translated as in which, that is the word bow. So, so not for the ships of Kitten, but in which the ships of Kitten shall come against him. Now, so we're going to say the ships of Kittim, these are going to be the Vandals, so we agree with Smith there. And they're going to come against Western Rome, right? Okay. So this is the Western Roman Empire. Uh, and he shall be grieved and return. Now, of course, we have the capital moved to Constantinople, but Western Rome still exists. It's what's going to fall. Eastern Rome will survive, right, for a while. Right. Okay. So it's Western Rome that's then going to fall. So he shall be grieved. Um, and we have that as 395 AD and returned. And so Stephen had, uh, you know, pointed out uh, this date for us. So this has to do with what happened with the Vandals. I can't remember exactly what 395 was, um, you know, what specific event, but it has to do with the Vandals and then return 410 AD. So that is paganism will continue to have indignation. That is, this is the continue, continuation of the 1260 years of the daily, even after the fall of Western Rome in 476, against the Holy Covenant. So that is paganism hates, though it coexists with Christianity. So um, it's what I had written in my notes. So we, we didn't actually have a present truth application to that specifically stated. But the idea here is that this indignation, we remember that the indignation is you have the first end of the indignation, right? And the last end of the indignation. So you, you could say that the first end or the first indignation is the daily and the, the last end of the indignation is uh, the abomination of desolation, right? The two desolating powers. So that's how we understand the indignation. So this is going to be against God's people, uh, Christianity, right? In this case, in this history, 
God's people, you know, obviously the Jews and the Christians. And then so he, so shall he do, that is paganism, the daily, and he shall even return. Um, so this has to do with Clovis baptism and have intelligence uh, with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, which is referring to apostate Christianity, the papacy. So you're going to have this transition from paganism to papalism, right? So this is addressing that whole fall of Western Rome, then the transition of how paganism becomes papalism. Now, some people have asked you know, me a question on WhatsApp regarding you know, the Catholic Church. Now, we generally just accept what the Catholics say about the Catholic Church, you know, that it, it goes all the way back to, you know, the, the third century or really all the way back to Peter to some degree, right? Uh, we, but the Catholic Church, you know, the papacy, when is it established according to the spirit of prophecy? What century? Isn't it the sixth? Yes, yeah, the sixth century. So we often talk about the Catholic Church or the papacy prior to the sixth century. But prior, prior to the sixth century, they're not established. You know, for instance, uh, the Catholic Church did not institute the Sunday, right? That's going to be Constantine. And, and he's a state power, not a religious power, right? right. Um, so sometimes we just kind of blur that whole history. But what we have is we have the taking away of the desolation or the daily, pardon me, and the setting up of the abomination of desolation. So the daily has to be taken out of the way before the abomination of desolation is set up. And that's in the sixth century. And, and we, we need to keep that in our minds that, that there is an apostate Christianity going on. That is, they're forsaking the holy covenant, but they're not established until the sixth century. And, and they're going to be inheriting Rome, right? Right. Be, the dragon is going to give its power, its seat, and its great authority, and, and great authority, not its great authority, it, his power, his seat, and great authority, which is not his to give. The power and seat are his to give. Pagan Rome can give those to papal Rome. But the great authority is, is something that really belongs to God alone. That's going to be given to the papacy. So the papacy is going to be given this religious authority, which is not his, it's not its right to have. And, and so that happens in the sixth century. So this is all preparatory. What's happening in verse 30 is all preparatory to what happens in verse 31. Right. So Angela just puts in there in 395. Uh, I don't know if that's actually the, the event that Stephen marked, but um, I don't think that's the event that he marked in 395 that Angela put there. But uh, anyway, we can see that, that this makes sense, how we've interpreted verse 30 and, and how Uriah Smith has interpreted it. It's very similar, but it's, it's all preparatory to understanding verse 31. So the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate. So that has been, uh, you know, primary understanding of the pioneers, that the daily is paganism and the abomination that make it desolate is papalism. So papalism doesn't really come in until the sixth century. Obviously, there's the precursor to that, you know, the the Christianity that has uh, become more and more political and worldly. And, and I bring this up a little bit, too, just because it comes up in the context of the, you know, the Trinity discussion where we talk about the Catholic Church or the papacy in, you know, the Council of, uh, how do you call it, Nicosia or Nicaea, you know, that, that that's sort of the papacy or the Catholic church in some ways it isn't right. There is, there's a disconnect from that earlier history and what we see in the sixth century. I mean, you're looking at, you know, the, the, you know, the fourth century and the sixth century, there's a lot of changes that have happened and there isn't a consistency. Like we just sort of, 
we really simplest simplify our understanding of history. You know, a lot happens in in that period of time. So anyway, it's just uh, that's a little bit of a tangent. But we, we need to be really clear that the papacy is set up in the sixth century. It doesn't really exist as the papacy as we understand it prophetically in, in the fourth century or the third century or the second century. Okay. An arm shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily and they shall place the abomination which maketh desolate. The power of the empire was committed to the carrying on of the work before mentioned and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength or Rome. If this applies to the barbarians, it was literally fulfilled. For Rome was sacked by the Goths, the Huns, and the Vandals. And the imperial power of the West ceased through the conquest of Rome by Odiacer. Or if it refers to those rulers of the empire who were working in behalf of the papacy against the pagan and all other opposing religions, it would signify the removal of the seat of the empire from Rome to Constantinople, which contributed more than anything else to the downfall of Rome. The passage would then be parallel to Daniel 8.11 and Revelation 13.2. So you have a couple of if statements. Which if statement do we prefer to accept at this time? Okay, um, so we got... Arm shall stand on his part. So the his is who, according to Smith? I think he's placing the empire as the his. So he's not saying that this is uh, the papacy. I don't see that. Okay. Um, well, so who do we say that the arm shall stand on his part? Normally, we would look at the arms as being Clovis, right? All right. But Clovis, isn't that just a little bit after this point? Well, we're, we're taking this as being 508, right? Because that's when the daily's taken away. But in his prior passage, Smith is introducing 538. Well, he's he's leading up to that. But th but this has to be this has to be, you know, because the taking away the daily is 508. It's just it it doesn't. He doesn't clearly mark who it, his is here, right? You, you understand what I'm saying? When oh, it says on his part, he doesn't really address that specifically. He's, he's addressing the polluting of the sanctuary of strength, but he's not addressing the arm shall stand on his part, who the, who the arms standing on whose part. Well, arms represent military power, right? Yeah, and we understand the arms to be Clovis, All right. France. Right. All right. So if, if if the arms, if Clovis is standing on his part, well, he's standing on the part of, of the papacy, right? Of papal Rome, right? The papacy in the in the sixth century is now going to have military might attached to it. The polluting pollute, of it, the um, polluting of the sanctuary of his strength, that would be Rome, right? Yeah, yeah that's that's. That's Rome, yeah. Okay. It'd also be the Constitution of the United States, wouldn't it? Yeah, but we're not making an application right now. We're uh -huh. just looking historically. My yeah. mind just goes there, Colin. Theodore, I'm sorry. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, Clovis, Clovis was the king of the Franks from 481 to 511. Yeah. And he's going to be baptized on December 25th, 508. Okay. So that's going to be when arm shall stand on his part is connected to that because he's, he's even before that there's going to be the France France is going to be supporting papal Rome, right? So we we have the fall of Western Rome. So Western Rome has fallen. You have all these Germanic nations, right, that are developing, and they're going to be placing the papacy upon the throne of the earth. So the papacy is going to be the one that's going to be in charge of Western Rome ultimately. 
right? There's going to be, you know, emperors and so forth, but they're going to be controlled by the papacy, right? That's what's going to happen. Okay. That, that's how we understand that history, that we have this. But France is going to be the one that's going to lend its military might to the papacy. So when the arm shall stand on his part, it's just that Uriah Smith doesn't say who his is. He doesn't address that part. So I, I don't know why he doesn't address that specifically. Correct. Especially since the second portion of that verse, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. So he wants to know, he, he's seeing that the arms are going to stand on the undefined his part. Yeah. And that these arms, they, or is yeah. it, well, okay, it's shall shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. Mm-hmm. So Which is, we, when we take that to be wrong. Okay. So the arms shall take away the daily and they shall place the arms shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Yeah. Are we making the application on this with Justinian? Yeah. So the placing of the abomination that maketh desolate is Justinian. Okay. Now, this all relates to, uh, you know, uh, Revelation 13, right, where the dragon shall, um, you know, give him his power, seat, and his power, his seat, and great authority, right? So this is a transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome, and, and this is how it occurs, right? So you have, in a sense, the fall of Rome, right? But paganism is involved in that. Right. And it's going to then uh, transition to Christianity and then support the papacy. Right. So papal Rome is going to become the power rather than pagan Rome. So with the fall of Western Rome comes the rise of the papacy. All right. And then the papacy is going to be at odds with, um, you know, uh, Eastern Rome. To some degree, right? There's going to be this division that exists between Eastern Rome and Western Rome. And then you're going to have, of course, uh, if you look at the trumpets, you're going to have then Islam coming against Eastern Rome. And, you know, so exactly, you know, we're, we're not going to go into that in detail right now, but you have these different powers. The, the role of Eastern Rome or the role, what's the role of Islam in Revelation 9 other than coming against Eastern Rome. Why Why does God have Islam coming against Eastern Rome? Why do we have the fall of Western Rome and then the fall of Eastern Rome in, in the fifth and sixth trumpets? So the first four trumpets deal with the fall of Western Rome, the fifth and sixth, the fall of Eastern Rome. Why is it that way? I mean, it's kind of a, I mean, it's what it is historically, but why does God do it that way? We're going to have God in control of that. Isn't this showing a complete fall of the empire? Okay, yeah, so you're going to have a third of the city, right, is, you know, you always have this third that's being attacked that's going to be Western Rome. So Western Rome, Rome is divided into three parts, right, through the three suns. Right. Uh, whatever it is, uh, you know, I know there's Constantine the second, Constans and Constantinus, something like that. Yeah, we covered that just a few minutes ago. Yeah, so those are the names of the three. Now, why do we end up with just an Eastern and a Western Rome if it's divided into thirds? Because one brother went against the other brother to consolidate territory. And that's in Eastern Rome. I believe correct. Yeah, so so we end up with just Eastern Rome. So Western Rome is going to, I can't remember which one had the Western Rome. One of his sons. And but that's going to fall. Western Rome is going to fall to the Germanic tribes. But Eastern Rome is going to eventually fall to Islam, a totally different power. So so what's the role? What does Islam allow to happen by attacking Eastern Rome? And also Islam, what part does it play dealing with Western Rome? Because what happens with Islam um, during that history prior to the fall of Eastern Rome. What's Islam doing? We haven't talked about that history too much. Didn't did they, didn't they um, join together? 
all the tribes join uh, Islam's tribe joined together. Okay, so the Ottoman Empire, what where does that empire extend to? What territory does it conquer? Turkey and all of that area. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's gonna conquer well it's gonna conquer Spain. Spain, okay. Right? Right. You know, that 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 you know, a lot of the, the Mediterranean. It's also gonna conquer Jerusalem, right? And then what does the what does uh, uh, the papacy do in that period of time with with Jerusalem? Crusades. But you have the Crusades. So so what is the purpose of Islam coming and conquering Jerusalem and then the Crusades? What what role does Islam play then? Because that's not directly addressed in Revelation nine. In Revelation nine, uh, we're mostly focused upon. The judgments against Eastern Rome, but I'm but being honest, that, I don't know much of that territory that was once, you know, part of the Roman Empire. I don't know, Theodore. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, a lot, a lot of this, you you have Islam conquering the territories that had been occupied by Babylon, that had been occupied by. Media Persia and Greece and some of Greece. Yeah. And, and also, uh, Rome and some of Rome. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it, it's yes. keeping the focus of Rome away from those that are still pure in their faith. Yes. It's protecting God's people. Now, amen. Yeah, here's, it, here's, man. Here is a, here's a very odd question. You have 538 as the year and the symbol from the charts of the abomination which maketh desolate, right? Yeah. And what was the year in which Constantine brought his Sunday law? Well, 321. So from 321 to 538 is how many years? Uh, it's going to be 217, which is what I thought. 217. And 217 is symbol of what in the Millerite history? Well, July 21st, it's midnight. It's also the Battle of Raffia. It's the, it's 31 weeks. Now, as a, as a final question, if this time period difference is 217, the symbol of midnight. Mm-hmm. What's the difference between when the Sunday law is brought in by Constantine and when the daily is taken away, meaning 508? Okay, I'm not sure. Well, so, okay, so 187, that's what you're saying. So you have these two symbols that are now, in a manner of speaking, presented for our consideration. Yeah. So we got 187 and, and 21, uh, 217. Correct. Yeah, that makes sense. Have we noticed that before? No. Okay. Why are we so slow? That's a great question. <laughs> so... Here we have we have this situation. Yeah. Now, I believe that we will find that there is a point where these two symbols are actually joined, where we will be able to make the application that for the movement, July 18th is midnight. Yeah. And of course, you know, we have between. Uh, July 18, um, uh, in 1844 and July 21st. It's obviously three days, right? That's right. the prediction before midnight. But here we have the 30 years in, in a different way, the three connecting the 187 and the 217. Right. So July and July 20, 21st. So that's kind of interesting. 
I'm sorry, Dwight. What, what was that other symbol besides the 217? 187. 187. So from 321 from Constantine's Sunday Law, it's 187 years to the taking away of the deity. And then okay. it's a further, so that's 187, right? And then a third, further 30 years to the setting up of the abomination of desolation, so the 217. So we have these primary symbols, midnight and July 18th, uh, being symbolized there, which is something we should have noticed. I'm, I'm not sure why we didn't notice it. I mean, we didn't even notice just that the difference between 217 and 187 is 30. And that, you know, between July 18 and July 21st is also three days. So that 30 relates to the three days as well. Right. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Okay. We are now past our time for today. Do we have any other comments or questions that we would like to bring up? Shall we then close our session in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, great is thy faithfulness. You are showing us day by day your love, your compassion for us. We need you. We need your direction. We need your guidance. We need your blessing as much as we need your forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for this time together. Help us and guide us now. For may your will be done. May we be able to represent between ourselves and those with whom we come in contact your character. So that they may be seeing your character in all that is done. I thank you for those that have been at this meeting today. For those that may view this later. Help us now. Show us that which you would have us to understand. May we go forward to glorify your name. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.